not a con. No, 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 that's if I drop my pants. I get five more dollars if I drop my pants and work it into the presentation. But we'll see how well this goes. So, um, uh, this entire thing has been fraught with horrible error because I tried to drive nine hours with a 46 and a janky ass 12 year old hard drive. So, uh, the actual computer to demonstrate like, hey, this is, do this and you get a picture is dead, unfortunately. But, um, but you can still look at the amazingly mammoth pile of crap that, uh, that the device actually is. But don't leave yet because I have slides and you're going to sit through them. <laughs> uh, so, I guess I'm, I'm Tanner or Kaz, whatever you want to do. Uh, I'm speaking on an improvised digital strip slash slit slash street camera. So basically the idea is, oh, do I have an idea slide? Yes, I do. Uh, the, the basic prim principle of a strip camera or a streak camera or there's like four different names depending on how you're using it, is that in the film plane of a camera, you guys all went to the be uh, beginning and intermediate photography talks, right? So you're all up to, okay. So in the film plane of a camera, you have a little slit like that. So rather than having an entire area of negative exposed at one time, you have one little, I fucking hate it when people don't turn their cell phones off. Um, and, and instead of getting the entire image at once, you just have basically a line. And so what you do is you move film across that line, so perpendicular to the slit. So as a result of this, you get an image over time which is different in a different way than if you take a long exposure with a camera and you get an image over time because things are blurred. Because at any given point, the film is only being exposed for a short amount of time, but the entire image can span a longer amount of time. So this is vaguely interesting for reasons I'll get to. Um, find something useful to do with it. So one, and these are, are my incredibly crappy, okay. Basically, it's, uh, it's this incredibly old black and white scanner that only interfaces with an ISA card, which is why I had to drag a 486 here with the drive failure and whatnot. But this is what you get when you take a subject, you have the camera stationary, so it's only exposing a little bit of, at, at a time, and you spin the subject in front of it. You get a rollout or peripheral photography. Uh, this is interesting to archaeologists largely or art historians because if you have, say, a vase with Greek painting on it, uh, it's really hard to photograph because from any given stationary point you're going to have different perspective at different points on the vase. Whereas if you set it in front of the camera, perfectly centered, and you spin it, and you get this nice rollout, you have the same perspective across all points on it, and that's interesting to some people. Uh, the other thing that you can do with it is, wow, that's really dark, is you can rotate the camera. So you can get a 360 degree panoramic just by taking it and because you're running it across this slit constantly and the exposure is correct within the slit, you get a basically a, a panoramic photograph that can go 360 degrees. Uh, that's pretty much that. Uh, what people get into more are things with moving subjects. So you have the camera stationary. So for example, in uh, the 60s, a couple of Time Life photographers got film uh, slit cameras and took photographs of Olympic athletes. So as something's moving past the camera, depending on how its position and orientation changes, it's reflected in the image. There's another guy now who is doing uh, really trendy skateboarding photographs by using a slit camera, because let's say, somebody is jumping through where the image is, 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 is being taken and they're flipping their skateboard. And then in the actual image, because of the way it moves, you get this nice like corkscrew. Because basically what, what, what you're getting an image of is a cross time of what they're doing. I am moving very, very fast. Uh, other uses, photo finishes, most racetracks. Um, I'm being required to drink, I'm sorry, hold on. It's Coke. Um, for example, at, at racetracks, because you can set up this, this camera that is taking a single line in space and making an entire image with it, you can set it up at the finish line of a racetrack. And then you have very nice proof of, oh, that horse's nose crossed that line in space first because you looked at the image.
Uh, aerial, aerial mapping is another one. Basically because, like, for the same reason that if you take an, an, an image, let's say from an, from an airplane with a wide angle cam, uh, lens, you get different perspective at different points in the image. So you're pointing straight down, image, or, uh, buildings on this side, you're going to see the near side. Building is on that side, you're going to see the near side. But if you set it up pointing straight down, as the plane goes over, you're going to get the same perspective on everything straight down. Uh, that's all I've got. Blah, blah, blah. I'm actually in competition with Irish for the worst slides of the conference right now, but I, I really... Did he already walk out? I guess I did sleep. Oh, that's... I, uh, I feel better about sleeping through his talk. So, basically... <laughs> Uh, this is th this is all talking about it in terms of film, where you actually have to rig a mechanism to wind film past the slit in the camera. Well, there's a really common piece of technology that uses just a line and creates an image by taking progressive samples along that, that, that line, and that's most computer scanners. You have something like a mirror under a light that moves across your flatbed that puts the image back into a nice little uh, lens that focuses it on a linear CCD. Now, those are bad uh, because generally the scanner does not work continuously. It goes an inch down the image, fills up its cache, it writes it out. It goes an inch down the image, writes its cache, or uh, fills its cache, writes it out to the computer, and it pauses. And that's no fun because it's not continuous. But, and unfortunately they don't make modern versions of this, there's the portable document scanner. I'm sure you've all seen them, a little handheld thing that you put on something and you roll it down and you're supposed to scan text with it. Well, what that does is just like a mouse, it has a little wheel with gaps in it and then it counts how many times it hits a gap. So you can actually control the rate at which it's sampling, which is useful for the previous uh, uses, useful for uses, right. Um, simply because if you're, say, taking um, uh, uh, an, 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 a, a panoramic, if, if you run out of space before you get around 360 degrees, that's bad. If, you're, if you have a ton of space left over, you don't have a whole lot of uh, vertical lines involved, that's bad. So what you can do, and this is the bit where I really wish this was actually uh, working, um, what you can do is basically take, and, and this is my amazingly awesome diagram here. Uh, can, I, can I hear some oohs and ahs? Nice. Uh, what you can actually do is, there's just a gear train here. You hook up a, what? <laughs> you, you basically just hook a motor up to it with a, oh great, I don't even have the fucking variable resistor in the photograph. Um, you, you basically hook a pot up to it so that you can control the speed at which the motor's turning and then you can control the speed at which the scanner is sampling and then you can control exactly how many vertical lines it's taking over the course of time, which is just like controlling the rate at which film is moving across, except since this thing has this nice dial here, the, on, on the actual scanner, one side of this is black and one is white. So you're just setting your exposure for the scanner by turning this dial, just trial and error. Don't ask me what the ISO of it is. I never really properly figured it out. And then what you do is you take the linear CCD, which, oh, check that out. I've got a picture of, that's a linear CCD. You're all impressed, right? And you take it and you slap it in the, in the film plane of a camera. And what I've always used is either a Mamiya like twin lens. The nice thing about twin lenses is if the shutter's open, you can still look through it, unlike like 35 millimeter SLRs. Or uh, this is actually an old Kodak Brownie, which uh, really impressed a lot of photography people because they're like, oh, you're mixing technology. Oh, it's like early 20th century and late 20th century. The theory, but um, it was more that it was free, like the scanner. Um, <laughs> what? I know there's very little Girl Scout jokes involved. Um, although now I feel so bad for not putting a slide in here with the brownie joke. Um, <laughs> what a total failure this talk is. I'd really love to demonstrate this because it's really fun to play with. Wow. 
Yes. You know, the, the absolute saddest part of this is, 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 is that camera actually going? Yes. The saddest part of, about this is that at some point, someone is going to pay money for the video of this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. No, no. I mean, like, like, I didn't want to say that it's funny that you guys all paid to get into this conference, and I didn't. Um, <laughs> Which is funny, but but no, but but the fact that my total and utter breakdown and failure is being recorded for posterity is just really amusing to me. I uh, whichever. So so at 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 any rate, um, you can make one of these by modifying a film camera, uh, and and sticking a motor on the film rewind and then doing all of these things, or you can take a three dollar scanner and slap it back in the in, in in the back of the camera and you can play with it. And it's actually really interesting. And it's terribly easy. And this is way more complicated than it need to, needed to be because the cable was a little short for my purposes. But you don't actually need to modify it any. You can actually just crack the case and usually there's a short cable that's long enough for you to fit it in the back of, of, of a camera and then you can play with it. Um, it's, it's fun, you can do things with it. I've totally lost it. So um, do, is there questions why this is, why I'm up here? I'm sorry, no, the, 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 the actual pictures are, are these sort of illustrative pictures here. Th these actually came out of the camera. Um, I used the, uh, the cheapest one, po actually, if you guys know uh, Enclaved, Enclaved actually bought this scanner off of eBay for me because I don't, I don't use PayPal or anything, so like, you, can, you can thank him for this. But uh, this is, uh, I mean, like, this is like, like literally like the first model of Logitech's portable document scanner. So you get something like 16 shades of gray, uh, which is why these images look just so detailed and sharp. Uh, no, that's not right. But I, I, more or less, uh, there's actually a name, uh, a, a guy named um, Andrew David Hazy, uh, who is at uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology teaching in the photography, um, the technical photography program, who's done the same thing using um, uh, basically, what what he did was he took a uh, a, a four by six uh, color photo uh, photo scanner, sort of like like the most consumer grade thing possible, simply because it was designed to read the entire thing in one go. So unlike a large flatbed, which will read chunks and then deal with with uh, actually storing the data, it just reads the whole thing in one go and does it. And his images are are a hell of a lot more impressive. But uh, since they made me sign the copyright form, um, I couldn't include uh, other people's images. Because there's, all right. You know, it's bad when I'm being pressured to drop my pants in the middle of a talk. <laughs> Take it off! Um, but I mean, he, he's, he's actually, no. Uh, uh, but uh, more or less, so, so you can get a lot higher res and color. Um, and actually, if you get some of the later models of uh, the color, portable document scanners. Um, I mean, the, the, it works the exact same way, but you get a lot higher resolution and in color. This is actually full resolution, and you can still see the pixels, which is really, um, uh, of course, when I say that, the screensaver kicks in. I should have thought of that before I plugged this in. Um, but I mean, basically you get that. There's, a, there's another, um, there's a guy in Japan, actually, who takes pictures of entire trains by setting up a slit camera in one place and then waiting for a train to go by. And then he starts the exposure. And since he has already figured out the speed that the trains go along a certain set of tracks, he knows exactly how many samples he's, he needs um, and gets these, I mean, like they're really mammoth, like uh, something like 48 to one perspective images where it's the entire like bullet train or things like that. But he's a nutty Japanese guy and um, yeah. A flatbed photo scanner. That that might actually be the same thing to use. I was actually looking for one, um, not for this, but uh, you can make like a 122 megapixel studio camera um, by getting a, a four by five. Because I've got a, a four by four by five view camera, and if you slap a flatbed on the back and use CKMY um, filters on the front, you get four different exposures. 
and then you add them all together and you get this massive thing. So I've been looking for something like that. But so this is entirely broken down into things that can be handled at the party later, which is in 522. Room 522 is the bucket party, so you should all come. I've Where's the money for that one? Oh. Um, then don't go to 522 at around 9 p.m. to drink screwdrivers out of a bucket. Whatever you... No, there's no liquor at all. Uh, just buckets. Oh, wenches? I don't know about the wenches. What's uh, what's what's the time? 7.20? Why, I've taken up my 20 minutes. And now I'm going to turn it over to Gabe here, who is going to speak about uh, platinum printing off of digital files. Oh, well, I'm suddenly less impressed, but no, I'm joking. They want you to speak into the microphone so that they can sell it to people. I'll just, like I want my every move recorded. I'll just put it there. It's it's easier to do. That yeah, it's not hard. Oh, or ten bucks. So, so anyway, um, a lot of people see these pictures and say, wow, how did you make that? And, you know, they don't realize that there are many ways to make prints from digital files. And, uh, the, uh, there, there's two, you know, I the microphone. Does this help? Can you hear me now? Okay. All right. So, um, so there, there's two basic ways of uh, creating a print from a digital file. One is to just take a white piece of paper and add some sort of dye or pigment, like uh, an inkjet printer, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, the artistic term for that is gicle, which is French for uh, spray. Um, yeah. And, um, and then you've got your typical laser printers, which use uh, a toner, uh, you know, different colored toners. There's dye sublimation, which uses a fancy uh, technical term called sublimation to transfer dyes into the paper. And then there's a solid ink or wax transfer, which just takes little crayons or, or ribbons of, of dye and heats them up so they melt onto the paper. And then the other kind is chromogenic, which is uh, Latin for creating color. And those start out with uh, some sort of white or other colored paper, and then something is applied to them and color is created. And uh, the three terms for that are pictography, Yes, there is a second R in there. Thermo autochrome and uh, a different kind of laser printer, which can also be LED, CRT, LCD, MLV, as you can see. All right, so um, you might think, why inkjet? Why not inkjet? Well, inkjets are uh, cheap. They're readily available. They can print on pretty much anything from um, you know birthday cakes or uh, boxes on an assembly line. And you can use lots of different colors. You can. Um, you know, have an eight color printer. But the problem is ink is expensive, typically more expensive than the finest champagne. Um, that's by the ounce, not by the glass. Um, and uh, your typical cheap printer that you'd have at home yields not so good output. And even the fast ones are slow because it's got to, you know, make each one of those billions and millions of dots individually. And you see, I have a picture here of a very, very large printer. That's called a Durst Row 160. What, the Durst? <laughs> well, pretty much everything degrades over time. If you're familiar with the iron death of the universe. And, and now, anybody who wants to hurt her can 
find her in room 522 at 9 o'clock. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, printers can be cheap. They can be expensive. Quarter million dollars for, um, for this guy right here, if you uh, really want one of those. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know if they uh, they sell those big ones on eBay, but anyway, uh, you know a print from one of those might cost a dollar and and take uh, many minutes to print if you've ever tried to print, you know a whole bunch of them at at once. You, you got to wait a while. All right, laser printers um, like you typically see they have toner. They um, one great advantage of them is that it's easy to duplex. You can print both sides. That's uh, one of the pretty much their only advantages for uh, printing photos, because they're not uh, photo quality printers. The the toners don't, um, you know, they're they're designed for um, making pretty graphs and stuff, not photos. Um, and your laser printer might cost five hundred to ten thousand uh, dollars. You're still paying about a dollar for an eight by ten, um, but. Uh, they're not that fast. Okay, now dye sublimation printers. Uh, these are actually very common for uh, printing out photos. You might see them at uh, your local uh, grocery store or drugstore. And uh, one cool thing is they can laminate, print gold leaf, not just uh, regular dyes. And um, here is a picture of one that uh, we have at the lab where I work. It's called a Shinko. And this uh, Kanematsu company makes Shinko, and they make um, dye sublimation rib rib uh, engines for many printers. Um, but a good dye sub costs anywhere between a thousand and fifteen thousand dollars. Costs uh, a little bit more than eight by ten, a buck and a quarter. And uh, the one I showed you costs takes about thirty cents, thirty seconds to uh, to make an eight by ten. And then you got wax transfer, which is um, not really a good way to uh, to print photos. Now, pictography. This is interesting. Um, this is the uh, the best form of digital printing. It actually prints a real photo. Uh, I guess what you would call a real photo. It's uh, silver based, like um, other real photos that you'd get at your local lab. And um, problem is, it's kind of expensive and not that fast. Uh, in case you're wondering how it works, um, Fujifilm invented this, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, and it uh, exposes a uh, photosensitive paper to light, but instead of red, green, and blue, it uses like uh, infrared and red light, 750, uh, 640, and maybe 870 nanometers, if you're interested in that sort of thing. And then it uses heat to um, develop the picture and then um, presses it uh, against a white receiver paper um, uses water, and you got yourself a print. Problem is, the print cost two dollars and took about a minute and a half to come out. But uh, at only four to eight thousand dollars, it's a lot cheaper than you know an eighty thousand dollar mini lab. And uh, more recently, Fuji came out with this uh, thing called Thermo Autochrome, which is sort of a whole in terms of um, photo printers. It has no consumables whatsoever. No water, no ink, no dyes, no ribbons, no toners. All you do is you put the paper in one end and prints come out the other end. Um, the problem is uh, they don't make general purpose ones. The, they pretty much only print on six inch paper and um, you can't just go out and buy yourself one in the US. Uh, and the way that works is it's, uh, it's got three layers on the paper. You've got a red layer, magenta layer, and a cyan layer. So to make a print, it passes the print under a uh, heating element, just like a regular thermal printer. And it uses low heat to uh, a yellow. And then it passes the paper under a UV light, which essentially fixes the, uh, the yellow so that additional heat won't change it. Then it uses more heat to create the magenta layer, passes it under another ultraviolet light of a slightly different frequency to fix that. And then it uses even higher heat to create the cyan layer. And poof, you got yourself a complete color with absolutely no waste. 
good for the environment, good for Fuji. I don't know why they don't make uh, more sophisticated printers. But um, the printers aren't necessarily cheap. They run from 600 to $6,000. Uh, it only costs about 75 cents for an 8x10, which you'll notice is the cheapest here. But they don't make 8x10 printers, so um, we're out of luck. Now, the uh, most important part of this thing is uh, really why I'm here are uh, regular light-based printers. They use uh, what, uh, what they call an RA4 process, which is the way color prints have been made in labs for probably about 20 years. All you do is you expose paper to light, run the processor, and poof, you got a photo. Uh, the problem is uh, exposing that paper to light is tricky because you got to make sure each of your pixels is exposed is just the right color. So, um, the way these printers work is you have a big rubber, you put it in the machine, and you tell the machine, um, here's the image to print, you give it a TIFF, a JPEG, um, some use PSDs or whatnot. So, um, so the way the light-sensitive paper works is it, uh, again, has three layers, uh, one for cyan, one for magenta, one for yellow. Um, which are exposed to red, green, and blue lights. Um, the lights can be created by any number of methods. Uh, you could have a thin CRT, which you just press up against the paper, like one line, a red, a green, and a blue line. Um, there are also fiber optic um, methods, which basically just take a white light bulb, shine it through uh, a whole row of fiber optics, and um, basically turn each fiber on or off, as the case may be, and um, as the paper passes under it and to expose it. Um, another method which is starting to come into common use uses uh, a uh, method just like these projectors here. You shine a light through an LCD or uh, digital light processor, those little micro mirror things to project an image onto the paper. Uh, the problem is if you look closely at these things you see a little screen door sort of because there's a little gap between the pixels. And um, most uh, professionals don't like that on their pictures. So um, the best systems use either lasers uh, or LEDs, regular light emitting diodes, to expose the paper to light. And then the uh, photons knock electrons in the silver to a different energy level and um, creates what we call a latent image. It's an image, but you can't see it. I guess it's late. So uh, the next part of the process is you take that exposed paper and you develop it. In some machines, the developer is attached right there, and in other cases, uh, you got to take the roll out in the dark, put it into the developer. So the way the uh, developer works is there's a chemical which reduces the exposed silver halides into pure silver, and uh, then the oxidized developer combines with dye couplers to produce colors. You can read it all right here. Um, I wish I had some more cool pictures to show you, but um, no thanks. I don't drink. Um, so then you end up with uh, <laughs> nobody told me to prepare for the uh, for, for drinking. Don't worry, I will be dropping my pants at the end of the. Uh, <laughs> okay, so then um, yeah, feel free to. Uh, Feel free to make a further mockery of this auspicious presentation. Okay, so take your um, your print, you run it through the developer, you um, you then bleach out the rest of the silver, you wash it off, and bam! Four minutes later, you've got a perfectly beautiful color photo photograph. Now these uh, are unfortunately a little bit expensive. Um, they fifty thousand dollars, they go up to about three hundred fifty thousand. Um, for the bigger ones, and if your printer does processor built in, you got to pay uh, five grand, you know, for like a used one or fifty thousand for a nice big new one. The advantage of these expensive printers, though, is the uh, the whole cost is only about fifteen cents for a uh, for an eight by ten. 
which uh, is a lot cheaper than the other ones. You'll notice the other ones went down to maybe 75 cents. These are 15 cents. So if you're going to be doing a lot of printing, this is what you want. Um, and another advantage is they're fast. Uh, you can, um, well, I won't skip ahead. But anyway, you, you can get 600 8x10s an hour from, uh, from the one I'll be showing you later, which is a lot more than you're going to get from an inkjet. So um, here's a little description of how the paper works. You've got uh, three different dye layers um, sitting on top of a, a, just a regular white piece of paper. And uh, different colors expose different layers. And you develop it, you get your nice pretty colors. This beautiful metallic paper looks, works almost exactly the same way. But the white base includes um, voids, as Kodak calls them. And that causes a uh, specular reflection instead of diffusion. And you end up with a metallic looking print, which apparently lots of people think is very cool because they invited me to talk about it. Unfortunately, this beautiful metallic paper costs two or three times as much as the regular paper. And it's very hard to find a lab that prints it. If you're interested, I have a ton of business cards, though. So. Uh, a lot of people wonder how I made my photos. That includes these big ones here and the uh, the ones strung up along a cliff out in the uh, hallway there. So the big ones, these guys, were printed on a machine called a ZBE Chromira 30 and processed on a machine called a Creonite KM3. The small ones strung up the um, uh, clothesline out there, they were made on a Noritsu 31 Pro and it's got a built-in processor. Yeah, well, I just thought they'd uh, you'd be interested in the technical terms. OK, so these big ones that were made on a ZBE Chromira 30, you've got a picture on the outside of the outside on the left. And on the right side, you can see the innards. You've got a uh, spool of paper here, which, um, which unwinds, goes over this drum. And here's the print head. This print head moves back and forth, exposing the paper to light, and it gets taken up here. Very simple. Yes, you might be wondering, gee, if this paper is photosensitive and he's taking pictures with a big flash, does that not ruin the whole roll of paper? Well, um, we in the industry have something we call a dummy or blown roll, which is paper which um, we can no longer use, and thus feel free to um, experiment with when uh, training people how to load the printer or taking pictures for presentations such as this. And uh, so anyway, this is a 30-inch wide roll. goes up to 165 feet long, which means I could make a print up to 165 feet long, um, which, which are pretty rare unless you've got a slit camera. That works. Um, so this very machine only has four modes, and uh, like I said, it's very simple. And uses Windows to um, basically send controls to the motor controller and the uh, LED controller. And um, so anyway, after you take the paper out of the uh, take-up side here, which ordinarily you would do um, in absolute darkness. You insert it into this machine um, called a paper processor. Here we've got a side view. We've got a front view. In case anybody is wondering what it looks like. Now, here is what the inside of it looks like. The paper comes in here, goes down into this tank for the developer, goes down into this tank here for, uh, for the bleach, and then it goes down in here to get washed. After it's washed, it comes across here. This gap is actually not that big. Um, but it allows me to stand here without blocking that. So, uh, so anyway, then the paper comes down here, gets uh, blown across a uh, big wire, and comes out the other end. And it's dry. And you get a nice big fat roll of prints, which you then have to cut up. Cutting it up is not covered in this presentation. The cutting? It depends on whether or not you have a manual cutter. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Typically, uh, 
employ a nice, cheap, um, illegal alien to do your cutting for you. His name is Manuel. The other option is um, doing it yourself or uh, purchasing a machine that costs uh, about $15,000 for one that just um, cuts it up into little strips, which you cut further. Or an XY cutter, which costs about $30,000 and will take your huge ass roll of paper and um, convert it into little 8x10 prints for you. Um, yeah, th this cutter uses small blades, not huge lasers. So, um, no, 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 no. All, all the lasers in the printer. So, um, so the, so the, um, the printer, which I use to make those little ones out there, is uh, made by Noritsu, and they call it a 31 Pro. It's called Pro because it doesn't come with the $80,000 film scanner. So the only way you can make prints is by having digital files already created, presumably means you're a professional. Everybody who runs a regular lab, you know, has film that they need to scan, so they're not professionals. Um, yeah, film is not professional, yes. Yeah, film has now been relegated to artists and people who are too cheap to um, get digital. Uh, yes, yes. You either have to scan your own film, um, which, you know, if you're professional, no doubt you have a much higher quality film scanner, or you use a digital SLR, which most of the customers of the lab where I work um, use. Yes, your question? No, professionals, photographers are use film, but clearly their career is of uh, limited uh, duration. So a anyway, um, <laughs> seriously though, folks, um, this particular machine can take uh, two magazines of paper up to 12 inches wide and up to 600 feet long. Um, it can make up to 12 by 18 prints, and um, it moves the paper past the uh, lasers, which did not come off of frickin' sharks. Um, Anyway, it can expose 150 inches a minute, which is extremely fast, um, considering how fast paper moves through, say, an inkjet printer. But this is a very complex mechanism with 13 motors, and um, it has a stupid little Windows UI, which um, runs on a computer, and that particular computer sends the bits off of its hard drive to another computer over some fiber optics. Um, yeah, what's your question? Wait, wait, wait. What, what are you asking? Um, yeah, well, uh, actually, failure is not an option. Um, and it, it's been my experience that the simpler machine um, um, is actually more prone to failure because the, um, the more complicated one, I think, has been around more to have its bugs worked out. The, um, the bigger machines obviously do not sell in such large quantities, and only recently was the 300th um, of this variety installed. Well, Noritsu has been making mini machines for decades. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, so instead of being, you know, a pretty much handmade device, it's, you know, designed in Japan with, you know, um, high quality processes, no doubt. And, and uh, as it turns out, they, they, this thing's got like sensors all over the place and, you know, it detects things that, um, you know, like paper jams and stuff. So it's pretty reliable. Yes? Uh, a high quality film scanner is definitely a bonus if you're going to be scanning film. If Uh, the problem with cheaper film scanners, 
which I mean, even the one that comes built into this machine, if you're willing to pay an extra 80 grand, is the the problem is that it doesn't have the dynamic range, and so you take your film and you scan it, and the, you lose either your shadow detail or your highlight detail or both. And um, most people don't notice because either they don't have that kind of detail or they don't realize it's missing. Um, Beauty of digital cameras: um, if you are afraid or if you are afraid of losing that kind of detail, you can just use raw format, and we got no problem with that. All right. Oh, this this this, this by the way is the um, what the uh, front end user interface on the Nuritsu looks like recently. All right, what's your question? No, 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 no. Um, no, no UV or uh, infrared light is actually recorded by cameras because, uh, I mean, unless you have a very special camera, um, you could. Um, so, as it turns out, optics um, uh, with typical cameras are designed to operate in the um, human visible light range. And. Well, cameras which are designed for IR, which is, as a matter of fact, infrared is very easy to pick up on a digital sensor. And so like professional cameras where color quality is very important, go to great lengths to put in expensive infrared filters. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's the human perception system is is, is pretty much impossible to um, duplicate properly with you know just a simple um, linear response um, image sensor. So you know people just do their best and you know leave the rest up to Photoshop. Anyway, um, getting back to the topic, this this is the uh, the screen and. Um, one of the niftier features is it shows you each print as it goes along through the developer. So here are prints coming along down into the developer, and then here is when it's about to go into the bleach, and here is the stabilizer section where things clog up because there's actually like four tanks, not just one. And then up here into the dryer where it'll pop out here and then go on a little conveyor belt into this sorter. Um, you can see also that uh, it's got a uh, about 10 gigs of space where it uh, stores the uncompressed images that it's about to print and um, other stuff like for example up at the top where it says printing except number 349 um, this was clearly written by somebody in Japan and translated because I have no idea what that means either Um, okay, so here is a photograph of the machine in the lab. Um, over on the left here, you see what is uh, the little operator station. It's got a little PC that you can see in there. Um, here, let me point it out. PC. Here is the, uh, the little place where you put in um, calibration sheets so it can calibrate itself. And uh, here's a little monitor with the interface. Uh, that part um, is, um, okay, it looks like uh, I have 10 minutes here. So the middle part, that's where the actual lasers are in the paper and all the nifty stuff with its 13 motors and its three freaking lasers. And over here is the processor. And uh, just like we saw in that paper before, you got your little device tank, your bleach tank, your various stabilizer tanks. Here's the dryer section. Prints pop out on here. And um, you can see these at um, many um, places that develop photos. Uh, Walmart uh, might have machines like this. Anyway, well, as it turns out, that printer um, prints on metallic paper or glossy paper or 
um, any other paper that you can get for it. The metallic aspect is simply um, the, the little voids in the base of the paper. So um, here's some innards of the, uh, the printer. You got some paper magazines here, which uh, get loaded in here. This is where the freaking lasers are. Um, paper gets drawn out of the magazine, gets cut into a sheet, goes up here, over past here where it's exposed. And um, these are the um, tanks of chemistry, which um, we don't use. So um, anyway, to uh, wrap things up, here's uh, I thought I'd present some real-world examples of where you'd actually see these different kinds of printers. Inkjets print pretty much um, everything from uh, cakes or actual printers, which print directly onto cakes. They cost about uh, ten or eleven thousand dollars. You can get them from a piece of cake dot biz, I believe. Um, or you could get kits at home for your own printer, which um, use sort of uh, edible dyes and they print on little sheets of sugar. Uh, Um, the uh, I, I have um, yeah yeah. Well, actually, they look pretty good. Um, uh, I recommend eating the metallic paper. Um. Metallic frosting. That's a good idea. I don't know. I don't know if you can print a metallic birthday cake properly. Um, actually, wedding cakes tend to have that sort of crazy ass stuff. Um, and somebody somewhere could probably do it, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of my knowledge, just slightly. But um, I do highly recommend, like, if you're going to be printing a lot of cakes, or possibly other foods, you definitely want the kind of printer that can print directly on it, because otherwise you have to print on essentially a, sh a sheet of sugar. And yeah, it it the, yeah yeah it, it has a straight paper and or a cake. Pie. Is it? Well, turns out there, there there's this. I'm sorry. They so um <laughs> so um so so anyway, it's you get a much more professional look from the actual dedicated cake printers than from just doing a standard inkjet conversion. Yes, yes, you put Okay, a, a, a cake printer costs about $11 for the investment, but once you've invested in it, um, the consumer bills are very cheap because it's just uh, essentially the, the dye, ba you know, the, the food coloring based inks. If you're going to do a food, uh, a food printing conversion to a regular printer, you have to keep paying for these expensive, you know, rice paper or sugar paper substrates that, that, um, you know, you don't want to have to do. So, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, paper jams are a common problem. Root somebody with a cake printer. That's, um, I, I'd rather not explore that option. Probably not, no. But if you are interested in doing a cake printing conversion, I recommend uh, Canon printers because their ink cartridges are, don't have any sort of crazy electronics that have to be reverse engineered in order to get the printer to work. You just fill up a tank and, you know, with your, with your cyan uh, food coloring and you drop it in and, and it works. I do not recommend eating cakes printed on which has been used before conversion. If, since you ask, the way the cake printer works is that it, it has 
Well, essentially a convection, which brings, it, which moves the cake or, or any other edible device, which, which any other substrate, it, it, which moves it under the print head, and you know the print head moves back and forth and advances the paper. I'm sorry. What was your question? There. Yeah. Well, the, the, that's slow printing is basically how how the, this sort of, how you know lots of these things work. You just move the uh, paper past a slit. Uh, in the case of a dedicated cake printer, uh, I do not know maximum length. In the case of a conversion kit, you are limited by the size of the. Uh, paper substrates which are available and uh, yes they do make uh, circle cut ones for uh, for round cakes uh, are there any other questions which may or may not involve um, cakes it, ah it seems um, a little miss um, Okay, so you want to know about transparencies? Um, you you can. It, it's it's not too easy to get, um, for example, in inkjet ink to uh, to stick to a transparency. So, odds are you don't want to print transparencies on your inkjet. However, laser printers are good at it because the the laser just toner just gets fused to it. Um, I'm I'm sorry, what? In, in a what in a what printer? The next, the, next, the their, their their old 400 DPI black laser printer. The well, it, it probably just wasn't using the right kind of transparency material. You'd want one that was designed for laser use. Back in you know 1990, they they weren't that common. 91, I'm sorry, um, but they were 400 DPI and um, used. It's a good printer, um, but nowadays, yeah, laser printers are, uh, are used for printing transparencies. Um, you can print transparencies with um, the big RA4 printers, not this. This would have to be specially modified to support it. But this thing can print on transparencies. It just takes longer to develop. Um, and, and yes, it's absolutely photo quality. The other option is Pictro. Um, this thing right here can also print on transparencies yeah well no that that's what I'm saying the um the um, this guy you, you can buy transparency paper for it which um, works just like the regular paper only it doesn't have the same white backing and it runs through the regular chemical processes uh, it takes longer to to develop, but um, the only big problem with it is um, uh, dirt. You, you have to make sure your processor is much cleaner than it otherwise would be. Are there any other? Y yes? That's an interesting question. He's wondering about um, how do you make sure that the color is the same each time? Uh, well, these printers have um, self-calibration mechanisms. I, I had a, um, I actually had a calibration print in my car. I forgot to bring in. But the way it works is um, it makes out a standard print, scans it in, and um, makes adjustments. It's a closed feedback loop. And um, uh, works very well. And then you have the problem of how do you make sure that both of your printers print the exactly the same color, and for that you you use an output profiling system. And um, what standard for? Oh, you mean like CIE Lab or or sRGB? Or the French. Yeah, that's CIE um, lab color. Um, I don't necessarily know how they model the colors um, inside the printer, but it, it, it to some degree it almost doesn't matter. It just knows that a the paper is capable of creating you know a certain darkness of black 
and it starts at a certain whiteness of white, and um, and then you've got a whole bunch of grays in between, which are, are translated to um, you know translated from the the RGB that you give it based on an input profile. So you can just say, okay, well this has got the input profile of sRGB or Adobe RGB or whatever, and then it translates it into whatever its internal color scheme is. Um, no, uh, it, it doesn't matter as long as they're calibrated to the same. I mean, I'll say, you know, my input profile is whatever, and it'll print to that. Now, essentially, it sounds like you're asking what's the default color profile, and that's probably... Uh, Oh, how does the printer know that we see the color the right way? That, that's just basically a question of profiling. Um, I mean, I mean, there there are color emitters which measure, you know, the exact. Oh, oh, okay. Well, well, in terms of ink, the, these these printers don't use ink. They they expose paper to light, and. Um, well, well, part of the calibration process is aligning the heads, essentially. And yeah, well, actually, it's guaranteed, it guarantees the color and the head alignment. Um, I, I could explain the the way it works, but um, probably the rest of the room isn't interested in that. And we have to. Uh, we yeah, it's eight. It's eight oh one. So um, this is officially over. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Anybody have any questions now? <laughs> uh, uh, two two five. Okay, so everyone, are you two two five? Oh no, no, five twenty two. I was reading my hand upside down. Uh, um, does anybody else have any questions about the bucket party? Okay. Well, I guess we're all. Right at uh, 9 o'clock then.